Good afternoon and Happy New Year. On behalf of the Jewish Democratic Council of America, welcome back to our community conversations on the ongoing crisis in Israel. I am Susie Stern, JDCA member and chair of the Programming and Events Committee. This coming Sunday, January 14th, it will be 100 days since Hamas launched their brutal massacre on Israel. Among the horrific and unconscionable atrocities that occurred on October 7, sexual violence stands out because rape was used intentionally and systematically by Hamas as a weapon of war. And yet, despite firsthand accounts and other evidence, we have watched in terrible disappointment as the international community, including UN women and other prominent organizations responsible for advocating for women, remain silent. We could not let this stand. And if we have joined our speakers today in ensuring the voices of those who have been silenced by Hamas, the many victims, either those killed or taken hostage, were heard, including in the halls of Congress and the UN. In addition to JDCA's advocacy, we're proud that JDCA New Leadership Council member Julie Zebrak joined other Jewish women leaders, including our panelists today, authoring a seminal piece in Slate, imploring the world's feminists to show up for Israeli victims. We are fortunate to be joined today by Julie Zebrak to introduce our esteemed speakers and want to thank her for her leadership on this issue, as well as her public service. Julie spent 18 years at the Department of Justice before joining the U.S. Department of Treasury as the Senior Advisor to the Deputy Director of the Financial Crimes and Enforcement Network, long title, FinCEN. She is now a political consultant and organizer, and we are grateful that she is part of our new Leaders Council. Julie, I take this over to you. Thank you so much, Susie. While this topic is very difficult for us to all to discuss and frankly to listen to, it's crucial that we tell the stories of the women who are no longer around to tell their own stories and tell the stories of the women who are still in captivity. Joining us today are three women who understand the importance, complexity, and implications of the issue of the Israeli sexual violence committed by Hamas. I'm delighted to introduce to you all my friends, Dahlia Lithwick, who is a lawyer, award-winning journalist, author, senior editor at Slate, and host of Amicus, Slate's award-winning bi-weekly podcast about the law and the Supreme Court. Dahlia's work has appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, anywhere any of us have ever read, <laughs> among other places. Mimi Roca is the District Attorney for Westchester County, New York, a position which she's been serving since running a successful grassroots campaign in 2020. Prior to her time as DA, Mimi served as an Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Department of Justice in the U.S. Attorney's Office in SDNY, the Southern District of New York, for 17 years, where she oversaw the prosecution of organized crime, gun traffickers, corrupt public officials, narcotics dealers, sex traffickers, and child predators. Jennifer Rubin is an author, an MSNBC contributor, an opinion columnist at the Washington Post, where she's been since 2010. <laughs> Prior to her career in journalism, Jennifer also practiced labor law for two decades. She is the author of the book, Resistance, How Women Save Democracy, Woohoo! from Donald Trump, <laughs> and host of the podcast, Jen Rubin's Green Room, which JDCA's Haley Soifer was proud to join in December, 2023. I am proud to be a part of this incredible team of women using their platforms to bring to light the story of the atrocities committed against Israeli women and to hold those responsible for their crimes accountable. Thanks to our three speakers for joining us and I will pass it over to Haley to begin our conversation. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Julie. We are deeply grateful to you and to the three leaders joining us today, legal scholars, journalists, and authors who have all given voice to the victims of Hamas's unconscionable sexual violence on October 7th and implored feminists and leaders around the world to take action. 
As noted, you recently co-authored an article in Slate entitled The World's Feminists Need to Show Up for Israeli Victims, which looks at why the international women's organizations failed to respond to the horrific sexual violence perpetrated by Hamas on October 7th. Jen, in your piece recently in the Washington Post entitled Israeli Women Count Two, you wrote, one is left wondering why Israeli women and girls count for so little in the eyes of so many. So for all of our panelists today, my first question is, how do you assess the international response to the brutality that targeted Israeli women? And what is the answer to the question you all have raised, perhaps rhetorically? Why has the world turned a blind eye to the immeasurable suffering of Israeli women at the hands of Hamas? Dahlia, we'll start with you. So I just wanna, <clears throat> first of all, apologize for my cold and I wanna thank you, Haley and uh, Julie and everyone who put this event together. Um, it's just so essentially important right now, I think, uh, in this moment to surface what has been just really rampant and frightening denialism. And I think the <laughs> simple and sort of depressing making answer to your question, Haley, is that it is of a piece with some of the impulses oh. around the October 7th attacks, which was, how do we show solidarity for uh, Hamas? Uh, and it, what the way the sort of zero sum framing of that quickly became by diminishing the scope of the atrocities on that day itself. And so whether it was tearing down hostage posters, whether it was uh, the impulse to frame this as a liberation movement, um, as opposed to uh, uh, an atrocity, uh, there was just a very, very quick and immediate sense that if we can somehow make this seem smaller than it was, it will be better for the Palestinians in the long run. And I think that very, very quickly we saw that really escalate to become full-on denialism, whether it was claims of false flag uh, operations, whether it was claims that things that clearly happened uh, didn't happen, whether it was a really massive effort to say perhaps something about this set of facts meant that the women to whom it happened are not somehow in the category of women who shouldn't uh, be raped, which is all women. I think that there was just a very, very hair trigger response to downplay this and kind of connected to that. I think there was a very immediate escalation of claims that if the evidence didn't rise to the level of some kind of unimpeachable same day evidence, then it could all be sort of brushed off and dismissed as though it didn't happen. Great, Jen. Thank you for having me. Thank you for giving me a chance to uh, chat uh, at least virtually with my friends, uh, Mimi and Dahlia and um, Julie as well. I think we come back to a central facet of anti-Semitism, and that is the delegitimization of Israel and of Israelis. If you approach the issue by saying that they are colonizers, you immediately dehumanize them. They become objectified. They become simply powerful enemies of the oppressed Palestinians. And once you do that, once you deprive them of their innate humanity, then you can brush off whatever befalls them as either their own fault or a, fact, a feature of their own propaganda. And when we see people in the media, when we hear people in the media, when we read people in the media that invoke this sort of language, understand what the consequence of that is. And it is denial. It is denial of humanity. It's denial of suffering. It's denial of truth. And that, unfortunately, we have seen in spades. Add to that, I think there has been a moral misunderstanding or a moral failure that sympathy for Israelis somehow diminishes 
the sympathy that one can feel for Palestinians, for Palestinian children, for innocents. And of course, that's ridiculous. You can simultaneously acknowledge a horrendous crime against women, a really atrocious um, scheme of intentional, widespread rape, sexual violence, and murder. And at the same time, recognize that, of course, we grieve for the lives of innocence. The same people, Hamas, have put those children and those Gazan civilians in jeopardy because of their attack on Israel and because of their habit, their practice of embedding themselves in the population. Add to this, I think, one more factor that we've all become terribly aware of, and that is social media. I think it has become a sewer for the worst impulses. It has become a propaganda arm of Hamas and those who are carrying its message. And it becomes easier and more convenient for those who would be inclined not to support Israel, to point to images, to point to messages, to say, listen, lots of people have questions. People are saying. That's a famous dodge um, for people who want to deny reality, um, pointing to others who are raising claims, no matter how specious. So I think when these things come together, as they often do when Israel is involved, you get this denial, this dehumanization, and this really crime, not only against Israeli women, and this is critical, but against all women. Because if women victims have to somehow meet some classification, qualification to count, then women everywhere are endangered. And that is the universal issue that we strive to address. Thank you. Mimi. Hi, um, thanks so much. I echo everything. So, so great to be here with everyone. Um, and of course, I can only build upon what Dahlia and Jen have said, because I agree with all of it. Um, I think two things are worth adding. One is really the level of shock that I will say I personally, but I know Jen, Dahlia, and so many other women had in those first days, weeks after October 8th, that there was such a lack of outrage by the international community and by women's groups here. It really took a little bit of time to sort of look around and notice the absence um, because we just assumed it would be there. Because to, to build on what Dahlia and, and Jen have said, we assumed that whatever people's feelings about the broader conflict, about the Israeli government, about Palestinian civilians, uh, civilians in Gaza, that everyone would still come to the central principle that rape and sexual mutilation and torture are bad and can, should be condemned. And you can, you can go on from there to debate everything else about the conflict and have differing opinions as people should, but not that. And so it was a, it really was kind of a shock. It took a little bit of time to even register that, wait, where is everyone? Where are the people who spoke up for Bring Back Our Girls, uh, the Boko Haram girls that were kidnapped? Where are the Me Too people? Where are the people who've spoken up, uh, you know, for Christine Blasey Ford? Um, you know, which all of us have very much been, and I'm sure many of you and, and the listeners here, uh, have been a part of. So I, I just, we, we've talked about the, the reaction, but I just wanted to define a little bit how shocking it actually was. I even started to doubt myself and was Googling rape and Hamas, you know, in those first few weeks because there was so little coverage of it. And granted, you know, these, it takes time for it to come out, but anyone who saw the picture of Nama Levy and her bloody sweatpants being dragged by her hair into the Jeep really, right then kind of knew what was happening. Um, and so I do think in addition to social media, we do need to blame the mainstream media as well. And I want to give a sort of shout out to CNN, who I think has been remarkable in their coverage on this issue in particular. Jake Tapper was one of the first to do, um, maybe the first to do a mainstream media piece on the sexual violence in particular. But the absence of media focus on it whether it's because they didn't believe it was true or it was too hard to cover, I don't know, um, but that really contributed to it. And I know we'll touch on this more in some other questions, but 
it, it cannot be said enough how dangerous this is, not just for Israeli women, though that in and of itself uh, should be enough that we care about these victims and what happened, but that the sort of victim blaming and shaming, and that's really a form of what is going on here, um, is going to hurt our causes that most of these women who haven't spoken up care about um, in the long run. Thank you. It's a good segue into something that you've raised, uh, Mimi, which is there have been many uh, incidents, of course, of sexual violence perpetrated uh, throughout the world. And I'm looking, we're looking at how, how this, how, if, if at all, this is different. Um, Dahlia, if you could please speak about the different kinds of evidence that exist when investigating sexual violence and why some of the evidence from October 7th was discounted by international organizations. In addition, we're wondering what you make of the UN announcement yesterday that they are now sending a special representative on sexual violence to Israel to investigate sexual and gender-based violence later this month at the invitation of the Israeli foreign ministry and, and what we could expect from this investigation, which will begin more than a hundred days after these crimes were committed. Um, <clears throat> before I do that, Haley, I just wanna make um, one tiny coda to what Mimi just said um, in her indictment of the mainstream media. I just wanna point out, there's a piece in today's Washington Post that use, uses the word, quote, apparently, about the rapes. So it is, I just wanna be really clear that this is not something that was you know, happening in October and November that has now um, stopped today in the Washington Post, there's still that qualifier. So this has really, I think, been metabolized into the ways that the mainstream media is telling uh, of what happened. And I really wanna highlight for people that to the extent that you know, part of our message here is that we have made huge changes, including, I think, uh, in uh, helping the UN move along. Uh, the fact that apparently is still being uh, added as a qualifier is, is frankly shocking, given uh, the amount of evidence that was amassed in the reporting in just in the last few weeks by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Um, just to answer your question, I think there's a couple of reasons that um, the evidence gathering was extra fraught in this particular post-October 7th landscape. One is the, the, the purely obvious, this was treated on the day of October 7th and the days after as a mass casualty. It was not treated as a crime scene. It was initially very much treated by the Israeli uh, authorities as the way they would have treated the site of a, a, a mass murder. And so some of the things that might have been done had it been treated as a sexual assault scene, which includes things like rape kits, uh, didn't happen. I I'm just going to say, and I um, hope people aren't shocked and horrified, a part of what made it so hard to gather evidence, even in the days after, was the absolutely monstrous abuse of the corpses. Most of the people who were sexually assaulted, who had their genitals mutilated, shot, uh, their bodies stabbed and slashed, uh, some of them were burnt, some of them were later identified only by their teeth or their jewelry. It is very hard to do a rape kit on a body that has been mutilated to that degree. So the collection of evidence, the way you might expect in a normal sexual assault scene was challenging. There's a second piece of that, which is intrinsically connected, which is that <clears throat> Jewish law mandates that the bodies be disposed of and buried quickly. That was done with to huge credit to the forces that came in and did that. But I want to be very, very clear that so much of the testimonies that we got in the days and weeks after October 7th came from people who were really heroically on the scene trying to dispose of the bot to, 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 you know, identify bodies to bury them in some form of dignity. Uh, the real premium on treating this as a sexual crime scene 
the urgency of doing that uh, was not the the number one thing. And so bodies were buried. And uh, again, to, to collect semen samples in that moment uh, would have seemed, I think, at the time, wildly inappropriate. In addition to which, and this is part of that second answer, I'm not sure that even the authorities in that moment understood the scope of the sexual atrocities. I don't think that they were coming into that to see whether there was a widespread pattern or a plan. That is the kind of thing that really was manifested in the weeks and days after. It's one of the things I think that was the impetus for Mimi and Julie and I and Jen to write about it. Uh, only after did we learn uh, maybe the last thing I would just say about the challenges with the evidence, and this uh, really is the beating heart of the point I think that we want to make today, is that we have long established for decades that you do not need a live first person victim to testify as to what happened. That is the law of sexual assault from millennia ago, all of us in our capacity as women lawyers have worked incredibly hard to say that if you have video evidence, as Mimi described, of somebody uh, whose garments are covered in blood, if you have um, first person testimony from people at the Nova Festival who described what they saw with their own eyes. If you have contem contemporaneous witnesses saying, this is what I saw. If you have rescue workers who found teenage girls on their beds with semen on them, none of the evidence that is being required, that is to say the quantum of evidence that is we need a first person victim should be required or has been required under any legal standard that we understand. And so just the very final thing I wanna say about this, and this is so important, is that the idea that women who have been subject to, and we know the data suggests there are five survivors right now who could speak to this at some point, that there are six eyewitnesses from the Nova Festival who could speak to this right now. There are three released hostages who could speak to sexual abuse. The notion that any one of those people has a burden and a duty to come forward and testify now in the midst of trauma is the antithesis of what all the work we have been working on for decades to protect survivors of sexual assault. We don't make them come forward in their moment of grief and trauma. And we certainly don't demand that if they don't come forward, it never happened. And just to Mimi's point, I think it is absolutely putting us not just decades, but centuries backward to lift the standard of if we don't have a, a rape kit and a semen sample, it didn't happen. This ultimately will accrue to the absolute harm of every woman, not just in war settings, not just in um, settings of international conflict, but to every woman that we've been fighting for for centuries. Thank you. To Dahlia's uh, point, um, I would add a couple factors. Um, first of all, we now have, because there has been such a denial of evidence and such a lack of comprehension, we have the people from morgues who actually physically handled the bodies who are beginning to come forward. Their evidence, of course, is just as compelling. And the reason why some of these people, we don't have the victim speaking, is that they were murdered. And that is also not um, something that we've been accustomed to. So the notion, as Dahlia says, that somehow the evidence was less than it was when you had, first of all, first responders, now who we have heard from, when we've seen videos that Hamas themselves took, when you have video of confessions of Hamas detailing the extent of the plan to rape, rape, to rape women, um, all of this cumulatively matters. But to your point, Haley, about the UN finally coming forward, the reason they did so is because the public pressure was too much to ignore. And that is a credit to my fellow panelists, to women's uh, groups, to Israeli women, to the Women Rape Crisis Center in Israel, to groups like the 
Jewish Democratic uh, Association with other groups um, from the Jewish community. And those people make a difference. Your voice makes a difference. When it is on the news pages, when one or more of us then come on a cable TV show to talk about that, when we specifically call them out and ask those hard questions, where is the UN? Why have we not heard from them? They are in fact susceptible to public pressure. And I think what we did, frankly, was we shamed them. We shamed them into coming forward. And it is a sad, sad testimony that that was required, that they didn't bring it upon themselves to move forward. But that just underscores the essential role that people like this organization play, that people um, like Jack, Jake Tapper play. And I want to underscore that this is not just women and women's groups. There are men who are obviously very much consumed with the issue, very much um, interested in getting the story out. Jake Tapper, who's a man, was the first one really to report on it in a mainstream outlet. So it's not as if this is just a women's issue. This is a issue of humanity, of human rights. And because our international organizations are flawed, and because there are deep elements of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in many of the organizations, including the Red Cross, which has now um, come forward and is experiencing its own public relations crisis because of its conduct. It really strengthens the need for advocacy, written advocacy, verbal. It underscores the need for public demonstration and to contact lawmakers so that they in turn can bring this to the attention of the rest of their constituents. Thank you. Um, the title of this event, uh, which has been referenced, focuses on how denial of the sexual violence that occurred on October 7th harms not only Israeli women, but women around the world. Um, Mimi, if you could please address this issue, how does denial of what occurred on October 7th impact all women? First question. Second, uh, given your experience as a prosecutor, what legal options exist for the victims to hold Hamas accountable? And finally, if you could speak as well to the question regarding evidence that I uh, had previously asked Dahlia. Thanks. Thanks, Haley. Um so actually, those questions are all three linked um, in this way. I think it's worth stepping back for one second because I think Jen, Dahlia, Julie, and, and probably many of, of the people listening, but not all, are, are so immersed in this. We keep coming back to the, why are you demanding to hear from the victims? The reason we keep coming back to that is that is the number one talking point for the deniers. And they're not just on the fringes of the internet. They are people with very large followings. They are groups um, like the Middle East uh, Women's Initiative. Um, there, there, are, there are large uh, coalitions, people, not, not people in the United States um, who, who keep demanding this. this. This is the latest and most prolific talking point of, it's not about believe all women because the women haven't said anything. The women haven't come forward and said I was raped. So it's not about believe all women. So that is the point that we all keep coming back to because it is so absurd and dangerous. And so that's where it links to the second part. Um, it is, I can sit here as a prosecutor for you know over 20 years, federal court, state court, like this is what I, one of the things I have been most focused on in my life, I became a prosecutor because my own mother was a victim of a violent rape. So this has been a number one issue for me. And we, as, as people who care about sexual violence victims have been fighting for decades to make sure that the rules in courtrooms do not, as Dahlia and Jen have said, require a victim to testify if they either can't, it would mean we could never prosecute someone for sexual violence if they also killed their victim. So it would reward a, 
uh, violent person who took the step of not only raping someone, but killing them, right? So if you think about it here in the, the case of an individual case, not this widespread um, use of uh, rape and, and sexual torture that, that we've seen here, but just in terms of one case here in a U.S. courtroom, we have more evidence than I've seen in many of the cases that have been successfully prosecuted here. Um, and that is without having the victims come forward, either because, as everyone has said, they are dead or hostage or should not have to come forward because they are not ready. The statute of limitations in New York State, for example, on rape was recently changed so that it does not require victims to come forward in a short amount of time because we all, and I mean this broadly, recognize that trauma, the way trauma works, is people cannot often talk about such traumatic events immediately. And here you have people out there saying, well, three months later, a, a month later, why haven't they come and talk publicly on the news about you know, this absolutely horrific thing that has happened? Um, so it, th this idea that we aren't going to believe what the women's bodies are showing us, that is the way that the women are speaking. It is their bodies and the people who are testifying and talking publicly, who are talking publicly about that. That is the believe women, right? It is the uh, released hostage who says, I was there and saw the look on one of these other hostages faces when she came out of the bathroom and I knew that she had been sexually abused and I tried to hug her and I was stopped. This is, you know, believe women doesn't just mean someone under oath saying I was raped. It is a much broader concept than that. And for people to try to narrow it down to this requirement that is unrealistic here and in many cases that we will have here in the United States is that is the danger. It is creating this standard that is so high that it cannot be met. And the other danger that I just want to um, highlight, I alluded to it, I think, in my first answer, is the victim blaming and shaming that it that is, is sort of coming back uh, through this um, issue now. Um, we all are, you know, I think most reasonable people would say, the excuse that someone was raped, you know, yes, she was raped, but her skirt was too short, but she was drunk, but uh, she was walking home alone in the dark. None of those are acceptable. Most reasonable people would agree on that at this point in time in 2024. But what we have going on here is a more subtle, slightly, version of that that maybe some people don't even recognize as victim blaming and shaming. We are seeing it in the responses to our pieces that we write, to our posts on social media when we go on TV, and I'm, I'm sure you are seeing it too. It is a, yeah, okay, rape happened, you know, maybe rape happened, maybe Hamas did that. No one's really denying that, but look at what's happening to the civilians in Gaza. That's just as horrific or more horrific. And this idea that you can even have a but at the end of the sentence there is what is unacceptable victim blaming and shaming. The idea that you can say, yeah, maybe this happened, maybe Hamas did this, but they brought, the Israeli government brought it on them because they are colonizers and were occupying Gaza. Again, people can differ in their opinions about those, but it is a separate sentence and concept from the first, yes, Hamas did this. And people have to separate them or they are allowing the victims to be blamed and shamed. And that is so dangerous. Thank you. I didn't answer your last question about accountability, but I, I want to give someone else a chance to talk. We, 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 we will get to it. We <laughs> okay. will get to it. Uh, but as you uh, and, and have referenced, far too many have denied the veracity of these reports of sexual violence, of the testimony of the images, and have equivocated in their condemnation in part due to political views related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We have hundreds, it looks like uh, well over 550 people on this call right now, men, women, all advocates. 
how do you recommend that we respond to this denialism, to the equivocation, and to the false equivalencies surrounding this difficult issue. Dahlia, we'll start with you. I mean, I think it goes back a little bit to <clears throat> where Jen started her remarks, which is we are just in an incredibly dangerous and toxic media moment where I think the imperative is to kind of do your own research, you know, the imperative is to doubt all truth, the imperative is to say, you know, oh, sure, the New York Times talked to 150 people for their widely reported story, uh, they uh, fact checked it, it took weeks to produce that story, but I don't like it. So it didn't happen. And I think we are just in a moment of deeply destabilized trust in all institutions, but certainly in journalism. And I think if you look at the reporting just in the last couple of days, we are seeing particularly on uh, Twitter, now X, uh, massive, massive amounts of disinformation that is rewarded by the internal uh, algorithms that really reward denialism and threats and sort of both sideism, uh, the nature of which Mimi just described. So I think there is a very, very strong impulse in the hurricane cane of that to be silent and to say maybe um, I too doubt, as Mimi said, uh, what I saw with my own eyes, what I know to be true, and maybe I'll just kind of keep my head down. And what I want to say, which sounds trite, but I think is very much the message that we wanted to bring up today is that to be silent right now is utterly, utterly unhelpful, that we're just going to have to keep saying it and saying it and saying it. It does not mean have fights with people on Twitter. It does not mean you have to answer every uh, threat or piece of hate directed at you. But it does mean that if you know something to be true, you cannot be dissuaded from speaking that truth. And as Jen said, we have seen in the last two months a huge pivot by the UN and other groups based on people willing to say, no, I know this to be true. And so it is a very hard ask. It is a very hard ask in the fog of war where tempers are very high and every single one of us is subject to very, very real and frightening um, blowback. But I think the very, very sort of simple one note answer is we have to keep saying it. We have to keep saying it because the alternative, which is silence, is to allow it to swamp us and to just recognize that there are very long term structural fixes we need to think about in terms of not just democracy itself, not just how we communicate, not just um, how it is that um, we make ourselves heard in public spaces anymore. But I think in this moment, the impulse to say this is all just too much is not acceptable, which is why I think, um, you know, having meetings like this is more essential than ever. Great. And Jen, over to you, but as someone who, who writes a column in the Washington Post, who has a podcast, who has really used your platform um, to, uh, to highlight this issue, if you could speak to what what you think can be most effective for us as advocates to do to um, to respond to the denialism and the equivocation and those false equivalencies? Let me make three quick points, um, just adding to what Dahlia said. First of all, we should not forget that this administration stood up in the moment. The State Department stood up, the President of the United States stood up, the vice president of the United States stood up. And that was, I think, a tremendous moment because what they were saying is the official position of the United States government is this happened. And I think that should be applauded. And one of the ways of combating denialism is to reward and praise honesty and clarity. And the president has no shortage of critics, but he may have a shortage of the vice president as well, have people who affirm when they do something extremely positive and hard. 
because this is going to turn off a certain element uh, of the uh, of the base. Secondly, on the issue of disinformation, we have to understand the intentionality here. My colleague at the Post, Josh Rogan, wrote a piece on Chinese disinformation, particularly on TikTok. And we have to understand that for young people, TikTok is one of their major, if not the only source of information. So when you have foreign manipulators who have learned, as Russia did in the 2016 election, how to provoke, how to widen the fault lines in American society, you will have an instantaneous, overwhelming gusher of disinformation. And that, in fact, is exactly what has happened. It's been organized, it's been coherent, and it was instantaneous. I must say, you do not get pre-pented signs with the exact same message at these rallies simply by happenstance. And so we have to be sensitive to the fact that we are in fact being manipulated. I would also add that going back to our central theme, people choose to believe what they want to believe. They have no problem believing that there are victims in Gaza. In fact, they give undue credence to people who say, no, the hospitals were not used for military purposes. That they tend to believe. But when we have evidence that is verified that the New York Times has fact-checked to death, that raises a question. And this, of course, is the operation of confirmation bias. So what do we do about it? I think, first of all, the fact that you talk about this in a group of people is essential because one of the problems is that this is morally crushing, isolating, depressing, and scary. So there is validity, there is strength in numbers. And when you feel overwhelmed by these things, rather than tune it out or tune it off, seek other people so that you can affirm for yourself, I'm not crazy, am I? And frankly, Dahlia and Mimi and I and others um, who are deeply involved in this issue do so as well. Because even for us, um, when there's a specific allegation, sometimes it's confusing, it's baffling. And we wanna make sure to do a reality check for ourselves. So advocacy, safety and, and reassurance in numbers are absolutely critical. And I think it's also important to work the refs. And the other side is very good about this. That's how you get disinformation on the front pages of the New York Times saying that the hospitals were purely for civilian purposes, where we now know they're not. And so what does that entail? That entails letters to the editor. That entails polite emails, polite, I would underscore, which are fact-based to writers and editors. They do listen, believe me, I get them. I'm not gonna read, frankly, the too long to read, um, you know, 15 columns of uh, commentary, but if it's short, it's to the point, it links to or provides hard data, people will listen. And I think it's also incumbent, um, and we have taken this seriously, that people who have a background on these issues write columns, appear in public, appear in all forms of media, so that there is a flag, there is a flag point planted in the ground that people can rally to. Because the worst thing is for people to suspect that they know the truth, but be scared off, be scared into silence, be scared into their own form of denial. So those are, I think, a few ways in which we can combat this really heinous phenomenon. Thank you. Horrifying images of women still being held in Gaza and testimony from some hostages who have been released indicates that sexual violence is likely still occurring. And just yesterday, there was a video and images of four female IDF soldiers uh, being held in Gaza uh, with um, blood and uh, it was horrific images. Um, Mimi, I'll start with you. Um, how can we continue to raise our voices in support of the 136 hostages that are still being held as we speak? 
And I know you wanted to address the issue of accountability. What and must, uh, what must happen to hold Hamas accountable for its crimes? So um, I think in terms of raising our voices, it's, it actually is linked to accountability because I would put accountability in sort of three buckets. Um, the first bucket that everyone who is listening and beyond and tell your friends can do is lift up the stories of what happened. Not just the general, there were rapes, but the actual stories. And I know it's painful and it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to reading about horrific stuff as a prosecutor, but I think it is really important, um, not for shock value, but because I think otherwise it gets discounted as well, you know, women get raped and more. That, that's not what this was. That would be horrific enough, but, but this is well beyond that. This was calculated, weaponized, to use the New York Times, uh, language, um, use of sexual violence to uh, control, shame, dominate, uh, and provoke uh, a response from Israel. So um, I think we need to tell, that's why those pictures are are so heartbreaking, because they bring it home in a very personal way. So when the hostage families come to your area, wherever you are, go listen to them, but more importantly, bring someone who maybe isn't so focused on this. That's something we have to try to bring people in. Um, the UN can be shamed, but everyone else, I'm going to try to give them the benefit of the doubt and bring them in. Um, you know, lift it up on social media, in conversations with friends. So the, telling these women stories who cannot tell them themselves is so important. That's the first bucket of accountability, is just making sure that the world knows. The second bucket of accountability is, is some kind of international tribunal. And um, you know, I, I think it's too early for us to even uh, try to figure out how that's going to look. As we've noted throughout this conversation, there has been progress that UN investigators are going to Israel, that they're being accepted by Israel. Um, this has taken many forms, but this, this isn't, we're not recreating the wheel here. This has happened in past, atrocities and it needs to happen here. So advocate for that. Advocate to our government, advocate to the UN, advocate to the Israeli government, who is also quite skeptical right now about letting any, uh, understandably, about letting any other uh, entity in to do investigation there in an unbiased way. And then the third bucket, and again, this is something that people can advocate for, is right here in the United States. And there's a long um, uh, history of this, you know, there are both criminal and civil statutes um, in federal law that very much allow uh, the Department of Justice and then civil uh, private rights of action against terrorists. And that has happened in the case of the embassy bombings, in the case uh, against ISIS, uh, the 9-11 uh, families. I mean, there, there's, again, a long, we're not recreating the wheel here. Um, I think there are more challenges when it comes to Hamas, though they obviously are a designated terrorist organization. And so that immediately makes uh, many statutes applicable. I, I do believe that there are already uh, certain lawyers looking at this. I, I hope that the Department of Justice is, is, is looking at it. I don't have any personal information. But again, this is something we can all advocate for because justice here for the dual citizens, which is who we would have jurisdiction over. And there are many, as we know, um, I think is an important part about bringing peace of bringing uh, the, the, the truth to light. Thank you. And, and Jen, over to you to comment on including the images we saw yesterday of those women, uh, men, children still being held in captivity. What, what can be done and how Hamas can be held accountable? Well, I think Mimi really covered the waterfront, the international, the legal, and the public uh, relations. And I think part of the issue of accountability has to be a re-examination of some of these international organizations as well. There has to be accountability for them. And that is part of what we have done. That is part of the shaming process, if you will. They need to look within their own organizations and ask the question, why were we so skeptical? Why did we apply a different standard? And I think those organizations need to be reformed as well. There are too many organizations internationally 
which reflectively take an oppositional position to Israel. We have seen the Red Cross really behave in a remarkably callous uh, manner. They have made very limited efforts. They have not publicly demanded to see the hostages, for example. Um, they, to some degree, have, um, I don't want to say covered up, but neglected to tell um, other uh, government entities and the press about what they have seen. And I think there is pressure to be applied to them as well. First of all, the United States funds these organizations. It is the major funder for the UN, and there has to be accountability there. So that means contacting your lawmakers, demanding that they have hearings, demanding that they have accountability for those organizations that we give money to. And secondly, I think it means that we all have to be, and our friends have to be, very careful donors. Um, if you have an organization that you give to, but then you realize they have participated in a great injustice, in a great falsification, think twice about giving them money. It's responsibility and accountability for the groups that are supposed to have women's backs, and they don't. And I think it's only when we address that problem will we avoid another instance. Because we know, because sexual violence is a weapon of war, that it will happen again. And I dread to say it may happen in Israel again. So I think accountability, not only for Hamas, but for organizations that are supposed to be on the side of women has to come. Thank you. And we'll we'll close with you, Dahlia, if you wanted to share uh, both reflections on that last question, but also some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, we always try to end uh, with reasons for hope. Um, these are very, uh, these are dark times. This is a dark subject, but we try to find some opportunities to bring in the light. If you uh, have any, uh, please share them with our audience today for reasons to be hopeful. So first of all, Haley, I want to thank you and my co-panelists and everybody who came today, because I think, uh, as Jen suggested earlier, there is a tendency to feel as though you are in this alone, you know, uh, checking Twitter and, and spiraling. And that's just not the case. There are so many, as is in evidence here, you know, people who uh, feel as strongly as we all do and who are acting in ways that are truly uh, astounding in a moment of uh, tragedy. I think, you know, I would just, as my sort of closing answer to your initial animating question, I would just say this is an, uh, an exigent situation. We know that there are people being held in Gaza who are being held in violation of international laws of war and violation of the Geneva Conventions. This is not a thing that anyone, I think, uh, who is a fair-minded uh, person would countenance. And yet we seem to have just taken it for granted that not too much can be done. And so I want to really ask folks to re-up on the principle that this is exigent, that torture statutes and international law has been uh, flagrantly violated here. And as Jen suggests, groups that are supposed to rush in to those spaces have been hesitant, if not obstructive. I think the last thing I wanna say, uh, just to answer your question, is that it seems to me that not one civilian in Gaza is safer by denying rape and sexual atrocity. Nothing about the zero sum framing that suggests that we can bring an end to a war, we can bring about a ceasefire, we can bring in humanitarian aid by denying that which is the single best, I think, documented, documented sexual atrocity uh, corroborated over and over again. And that the thinking that this somehow brings about peace or uh, liberation or justice puts us all back, as I said, hundreds of years. And as everyone has said, will only redound to the harm of women and vulnerable people going forward. Because if you can make determinations, as Mimi says about, but she deserved it, 
then we are going absolutely, absolutely down a really perilous trail uh, for women and victims everywhere. So my source of hope uh, to answer your final question is that I think we have seen a sea change in the conduct of many groups, both domestically and around the world as a result of women and their allies on this call uh, who are men pushing, pushing, pushing for change, demanding results, working the refs, saying I will absolutely not tolerate this, and the very brave families of hostages who are working on this as well. And so what gives me hope is the knowledge that we can sit in groups like this, Haley, and absolutely watch ourselves bring about change. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the three, uh, our three panelists who, who give me hope, uh, bringing their expertise, uh, their background, their, their legal authority to this issue. Um, it's, you've, you've all used your platform to give voice to those who have been silenced, and it has been so critical, and we, we really appreciate your leadership. We also recognize this is not just a women's issue. Uh, and we are grateful for our new leaders as a part of the Jewish Democratic Council of America. So I want to bring in Joe Goldman coming to us from California, one of our new leaders, uh, to conclude our program. Joe. Thank you, Haley, and thank you, Jen, Mimi, Dahlia, for joining us today for this crucial, painful, and illuminating conversation. As a lifelong feminist who has lost an aunt to gender-based violence and has countless loved ones in Israel who all know people killed, injured, and or kidnapped on October 7th, it's critical that we do whatever possible to overcome the profound denialism of crimes uh, perpetrated by Hamas. This is not just a women's issue, this is an everyone issue, period. And as we continue in this righteous fight, we are allowed to hold space for the profound and debilitating suffering of the millions of innocent civilians in Gaza, whether it's our friends who failed us or the extremists who seek to dehumanize Israelis and Jews, pushing us into looking the other way it is losing who we are as a people. And we are a people who believe in B'Tselem Elohim, that we are all made in the same image. We can and must do both without equivocating on either. We hope that you were inspired to advocate for those who can no longer advocate for themselves to take action right now. Please take time to fill out our action item to urge Congress to condemn the use of sexual violence by Hamas in the chat. We also encourage you to visit jewishdems.org where you can learn all about the ways you can join us at JDCA, including by joining one of our local and state chapters or affiliates made up of grassroots volunteers, becoming a JDCA member, and by making a financial contribution to support our work in this make or break 2024 election cycle. We also hope that you will continue to join JDCA for our next virtual event with our Southern California chapter next week on Wednesday, January 17th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern for our California 30th Democratic Primary Issues Forum. That's for Adam Schiff's seat. We will be joined by the top five candidates uh, for this primary. As someone coming to you from LA, I can attest about the importance of this race and the fact that the path to Democratic controlled Congress goes right through California. You can sign up in the link in the chat by going or by going to jewishdems.org slash events. Thank you all so much for joining us and for continuing to stay involved with JDCA. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you again to Julie also for helping us to organize this very important event. Thank you.